My name is Carrie Walker, and I'll be facilitating the Village's Health presentation on answering the question of, is it chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, or is it something else? Please keep in mind that the information contained in this presentation is for educational purposes only and should not take the place of advice from your healthcare professional. By the end of today's presentation, our hope is that you'll have a better understanding of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, what it is, causes and symptoms, diagnosis and treatment, and potential lifestyle changes that you can use to reduce your risk and manage symptoms. In order to understand what COPD is and how it affects the lungs, it's first necessary to understand how the lungs work. You see here a picture of all the different organs and parts of our body that make up the respiratory system, beginning with the nasal cavity and the mouth, following down through the pharynx and larynx, through your trachea. The trachea forks into a left and a right, forming the bronchi. The bronchi are the larger tubes, which then branch into smaller tubes called bronchioles. At the end of each bronchial is an alveoli or air sac. The muscle you see underneath the lungs is the diaphragm. On any given day, we have hundreds of things we have to remember to do. Fortunately, one of the things we don't have to remember to do is to breathe. When we breathe, we transport oxygen to the body cells to keep them working and clear carbon dioxide out of our system that this work generates. How do we accomplish this specialized task? The answer is with complex machinery called the respiratory system. Like any system, it consists of specialized parts that require a trigger to start functioning. These parts are the structures that make up the lungs and their supporting organs that we recently reviewed, the bronchi, the bronchioles, and alveoli in the lungs and the trachea and diaphragm. To get the system started, we need a trigger. This trigger is called the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is our body's unconscious control of vital functions, such as breathing. As the body prepares to take in oxygen rich air, this system sends a signal to the muscles around your lungs, causing them to contract the muscles against your ribs to create more space for the lungs to expand and fill with air. Air then whooshes into your mouth and nose, down through your trachea and into the bronchi that split at the base into the right and left lung. Like tree branches, these small tubes divide into thousands of tinier passageways called the bronchioles. At the end of each bronchial, there is a tiny air sac. Each air sac is then wrapped in capillaries full of red blood cells containing specialized proteins called hemoglobins. Capillaries are hair-like blood vessels, very fragile. The air we breathe in fills these air sacs, causing our lungs to inflate. Here's where the vital exchange occurs. At this point, the capillaries are packed with CO2 or carbon dioxide, and the air sacs inside the lungs are full of oxygen. Due to the process of diffusion, the molecules of each gas want to move to a place where there's a lower concentration of their kind. This means oxygen then crosses over into the capillaries from the lungs going into the bloodstream. The hemoglobin grabs it up while the carbon dioxide goes the opposite way and is unloaded into the lungs. The oxygen rich hemoglobin is a transport mechanism that carries the oxygen to the cells via our bloodstream. And then what does all the excess carbon dioxide do in the lungs? It gets ex exhaled, of course. The autonomic nervous system kicks in again, this time triggering the respiratory muscles to relax, making the chest cavity smaller and forcing the lungs to compress. Our lungs inhale and exhale anywhere from 15 to 25 times a minute, processing approximately 10,000 liters of air per day. What is COPD then? Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease 
aka COPD, is a common problem that 24 million in the U.S. are thought to have, but few people have a grasp of what it is. In fact, half of the people who have COPD don't even know it. Why? This is because the COPD symptoms can creep up gradually or be mistaken for something else, such as a cough, allergies, cold, flu, or any other less serious ailments. If you have COPD, this means that you have either emphysema or chronic bronchitis, or most often both. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is like an umbrella term. It describes primarily two different lung diseases that block airflow and make breathing increasingly difficult. Most people who have COPD do have both emphysema and chronic bronchitis, but the severity of each condition varies from person to person. That's why the general term COPD is more accurate nowadays than just telling someone that they have both emphysema and chronic bronchitis. We'll take a look at what each one is individually now. Emphysema is a lung condition that affects the air sacs or the alveoli in your lungs. As you see in the small cutout on the left, on the right side of your screen, the leftmost cutout though, there's small alveoli forming small compartments in the lungs. They are normally elastic and stretchy. When you breathe in, as we discussed in the previous slide, each air sac fills up like a balloon. And when you breathe out, the air sacs deflate and the air goes out. However, with emphysema, the air sacs become less elastic and the walls between many of them can become damaged, which results in the creation of one large air sac, as you can see in the little insect that labeled emphysema. This makes it harder for your lungs to move oxygen in to your body and carbon dioxide out of your body, trapping air inside your lungs, making you feel short of breath. Chronic bronchitis is inflammation or swelling and irritation of the bronchial tubes. Emphysema affects the alveoli and chronic bronchitis affects the, bron uh, the bronchioles. Bronchial tubes are the airways that carry air to and from the air sacs in your lungs. Inflammation or irritation of these tubes causes thick mucus to build up, blocking the passage of air and making it difficult to breathe, as you can see. Oftentimes, chronic bronchitis can be confused with asthma. Asthma is a condition in which your airways become inflamed and produce mucus, but the airways also constrict. Because the air, uh, the bronchioles are extra sensitive to things that, uh, excuse me, the bronchioles become inflamed. This makes them extra sensitive to things that you're exposed to in the environment every day or asthma triggers. A trigger could be cold, a cold, or the weather, or things in the environment such as dust, chemicals, smoke, and pet dander. When you breathe in a trigger, the insides of your airways swell even more. This narrows the space for the air to move in and out of the lungs. The muscles that wrap around your airways can tighten, making breathing even harder. When that happens, it's cause, called an asthma flare-up or an episode. So you can see that asthma is very similar in presentation to chronic bronchitis. Let's take a look at some of the differences. Asthma typically occurs before, can occur before the age of 40. It can also be um, had in people over the age of 40, but the main difference is COPD usually does not occur in people under the age of 40 primarily due to the cause, because COPD is usually caused by damage from smoking. Um, asthma is, is due to an inflammatory, inflammatory reaction to an allergen, as I mentioned, dust, chemicals, or perhaps pet hair. The symptoms change a little bit too. With asthma, the symptoms are periodic or episodic attacks of wheezing, tightness in the chest, often brought on by exposure to those triggers. 
with COPD, the symptoms remain more constant, not episodic. And the prognosis, asthma, can be largely controlled through medication and lifestyle. COPD is a progressive disease that although the symptoms can most be managed, damage does increase over time in the lungs. Risk factors for COPD are largely connected to smoking. Cigarette smoking is the primary risk factor for COPD. Most people who have COPD smoke or used to smoke. Sig secondhand cigarette smoking can also be a cause. Up to 75% of people who have COPD or used to smoke or, or currently smoke. People who also have a ham family history of COPD are more likely to de develop the disease if they in turn smoke as well. It's important to mention that although the majority of people who have COPD have smoked, a relatively small portion of smokers actually develop COPD. As low as 25%, so 25 to 40% of smokers will develop COPD. So it is important to consider other potential causes or exposure to lung irritants. Examples of these lung irritants include air pollution, chemical fumes, especially on the job working, dust from the environment, secondhand smoke, et cetera. Most people who have COPD are at least 40 years old when symptoms begin. Although uncommon, people younger than 40 can also have COPD. This may occur, for example, if a person has a, a predisposing health issue, such as a genetic condition known as alpha-1. The symptoms can easily look like something else other than COPD. One of the symptoms is shortness of breath. Routinely, you may feel shortness of breath that gets worse during exercise or exertion, even if you don't have COPD. However, with time, people who do have COPD can struggle to catch their breath even, breath even when getting dressed or doing other simple daily activities of life. The difficulty comes from lack of flexibility in the lungs and an ability to compress the lungs enough to exhale air. Another symptom is coughing. A chronic cough, which you may first attribute to a cold or other minor condition, can be an early sign of COPD. Unlike other coughs, however, it doesn't go away or it doesn't go away for a very long time. The coughing is a sign that your body is trying to move the mucus out of the bronchioles, out of the lungs, or, react, or is reacting to the irritants. This symptom, like others, might actually improve initially with some kind of treatment, but it doesn't get better over the long term. Excess mucus is another symptom. Coughing up mucus and phlegm is a common sign. Even healthy people can produce mucus to keep the airways moist, but in COPD, too much mucus is getting produced and it can act like a spider's web, trapping smoke, bacteria, or other particles that would normally be expelled from the lungs. Clear colored mucus is most common, but mucus that turns deep yellow, green, brown, or red, or is blood tinged could mean that lungs have an infection and should also be looked at. Wheezing is a symptom reserved more for COPD. When the airways narrow too, from too much mucus or other problems, the air trying to force its way in or out of the lungs can cause a whistling sound known as wheezing. It sounds like the lungs are making a noise when you're breathing. And this is unique to COPD more so than any of the other symptoms. Chest tightness or pain is another common symptom that can affect people with COPD. The effort involved in breathing can make you sore, and the inability to exhale doesn't allow the chest to completely relax, which causes muscles to remain contracted. Coughing really hard can also strain the chest muscles, causing pain. 
Feeling tired is a common problem with COPD, mainly because the body has to work so much harder to breathe. A steady supply of oxygen is needed to metabolize energy. Reduced oxygen capacity can cause fatigue. Reduced lung capacity contributes to a reduced ability to exercise, which in turn can lead to more tiredness because your body is not as in shape as it once was. Listed here are some of the symptoms uh, attributed to late stage COPD. Uh, blue tinted skin, known as cyanosis, occurs when not enough oxygen reaches the body's tissues. Because the lungs are chronically overinflated with air, the rib cage stays partially expanded all the time, causing a barrel chested like look. Um, explained weight loss. Damaged lungs can burn up to as much as 10, 10 times the calories than normal healthy lungs, contributing to unexplained weight loss. Swelling of the feet. When the liver and kidneys, which filter toxins and fluids from the blood, receive insufficient oxygen, they become ineffective, ineffective, resulting in harmful swelling. And lastly, low energy, excuse me, low oxygen levels in the brain may in turn lead to problems that affect cognitive performance. In the onset, symptoms such as coughing, occasional shortness of breath, the need to clear your throat might appear non-threatening or indicate indicative of any chronic disease but over time as these symptoms worsen it tips the scale and people are more prone to need medical attention and also more prone to other respiratory infections so it's important to pay attention to the symptoms and monitor their severity and length of time that you've had them there's no single test for diagnosing COPD. The diagnosis is based on symptoms, a physical exam, and a diagnostic test results. Make sure that when you visit your doctor, you mention all of the following. Tell your doctor if you're a smoker or if you've smoked in the past. Tell him or her if you've, you're exposed or were exposed to lung irritants. Whether you're exposed to a lot of secondhand smoke. Tell your practitioner if you've had a family history of COPD. And if you have a cough, tell them how long you've had it. Mention whether you've had asthma or other respiratory conditions and whether you take over-the-counter or prescription medications, which may be controlling some of these symptoms. During the physical exam, your doctor will use a stethoscope to listen to your lungs as you breathe. Based on what he, him or her hears, your doctor may order some of the following tests to get a complete picture of what's happening. Spirometry is a non-invasive test to assess lung and function. During the test, you'll take a deep breath and then blow into a tube connected to the spirometer. Imaging tests could include a chest x-ray or a CT exam. These images can provide a detailed look at your lungs, blood vessels, and heart. An arterial blood gas test involves taking a blood sample from an artery to measure your blood oxygen levels, carbon dioxide, and other important levels. These tests can help determine if you have COP or, diff or a different condition such as asthma, a restrictive lung disease, or heart failure. A spirometer is going to assess how well your lungs work by measuring how much air you inhale how much you exhale, and how quickly you exhale. Spirometry is used to diagnose asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and other conditions that affect your breathing. COPD has no cure yet. However, lifestyle changes and treatments can help you feel better, stay more active, and slow the progress of the disease. The goals of the treatment include Improving your exercise tolerance or your ability to stay active to keep your body healthy. Relieving your symptoms, slowing the progress of the disease, preventing and treating complications, and improving your overall health. So I encourage you that just because COPD doesn't have a cure yet, to make sure to check in with your health 
provider to see what you can do to manage your condition and maintain a high quality of life. Possible treatments include medication. Usually bronchodilators are medications that help relax the muscles of the airways, widening, the air, widening them so you can breathe easier. They're taken through an inhaler or a nebulizer. Glucocorticosteroids can be added to reduce inflammation in the, air, in the airways. To lower risk of other respiratory infections, ask your doctor if you should get a yearly flu shot. Pneumonia vaccine or a tetanus booster. All these can help protect you against other respiratory infections, which will exacerbate your COPD. Other possible treatments include something referred to as pulmonary rehabilitation. It's a program in which you will work with various healthcare providers, including your doctor, nurses, physical therapists, respiratory therapists, exercise specialists, and dietitians to help create a program that meets your needs and reduces your symptoms. If you have more severe COPD or lower levels of oxygen in your blood, oxygen therapy may be prescribed. Oxygen is delivered through a nasal, through nasal prongs or a mask. It may be needed all the time or only at certain times. I included this picture here to show you that portable units are becoming increasingly convenient and easier to transport. For some people who have severe COPD, using extra oxygen for most of the day can help them continue to do tasks or activities while experiencing fewer symptoms protect their hearts and other organs from damage, and also sleep more during the night and improve alertness during the day. So make sure if you find yourself experiencing shortness of breath when you're not using oxygen, consider the benefits, leaving pride at the door and using your oxygen when needed. Surgeries for people who have COPD is mainly related to those who have emphysema. And they're used as a last resort. A bolectomy is when the walls of the air sacs are destroyed. Larger air spaces called bullae form. These air spaces can become so large that they interfere with breathing. In the bolectomy, doctors remove one or more of, the, of those large bullae from the lungs. Lung reduction surgery is another surgery in which surgeons remove damaged tissue from the lungs. This helps them work better. In carefully selected patients, lung volume reductive surgery can improve breathing and the quality of life. Lastly, lung transplant can be an option. Doctors remove the damaged lung and replace it with a healthy lung from a donor. A lung transplant can improve your lung fun function and quality of life as well. However, lung transplants have many risks, such as infections and rejection of the transplanted lungs. If you have very severe COPD, talk with your doctor about whether a lung transplant is an option, and then explore the benefits and risks of the surgeries. Living with COPD, certain lifestyle changes may also help alleviate your symptoms or provide relief. The biggest one is if you're smoking, quit. Some people feel that if they've been smoking so long over the period of their life that it won't make a difference if they quit. That is definitely not true. Just 12 hours after your last cigarette, the carbon monoxide levels in your blood return to normal. This helps get your body the oxygen it needs for all the cellular function. A critical aspect of lung health is having healthy cilia. Excuse me, cilia. Cilia are tiny hair-like organelles that are found all throughout your body. The cilia in the lungs sweep out debris, mucus, and other pollutants. Lung improvements begin after two to three months, two weeks to three months. And during this time, the cilia in your lungs can be replaced, it repairs itself and repopulates. 
Healing your lungs after quitting smoking is going to take time. There's no magic pill to make chest discomfort after quitting smoking disappear. But there are other tips and tricks to give your lungs the best shot at a speedy recovery. The foods that I'm going to list are below are mucus producing and increase mucus in the lungs significantly, making it harder to clean them after quitting smoking. So these are the ones you want to avoid or limit. Dairy products. Dairy products, this includes cheese, butter, cream, yogurt, and milk, including non-fat varieties. This consumption of dairy products greatly increases mucus production in your lungs. Processed foods. Avoid any meats that have been modified to extend shelf life or augment tastes such as jerky, bacon, ham, salami, sausage, hot dogs, canned meat, and others. Fast food meals are also highly processed and should be avoided. Processed vegan and vegetarian foods and food substitutes like mock meat and cheese substitutes are also heavy mucus producers. Packaged convenience foods, including frozen uh, convenience foods can should be left on the shelf. Avoid them. Mm -hmm. Candies and sweets. Avoid candy bars, pies, cakes, pastries, taffy, gelatin, and other sugary treats. Sweets can be comfort food for some people, but if your lungs hurt after quitting smoking, these aren't going to help you feel better because they sugar contributes to inflammation. Caffeine. Avoid coffee and highly caffeinated teas or sodas. Instead, drink lots of water. Green tea is caffeinated, but it can also be a very uh, oxida oxi antioxidant rich source and may actually pr prove to be beneficial for lung pain after quitting smoking. Foods that contain antioxidants can help clear toxins from the body, including the lungs. Some of the foods you may wanna consider adding into your diet are pineapple. Pineapple contains a compound called bromelain, which helps reduce inflammation. Bromelain also helps you increase lung elasticity so you can take in more oxygen with each deeper breath. Some anecdotal evidence suggests that taking the teaspoon of honey daily can provide many health and benefits, including pollutants from the lung. Um, foods hand high in antioxidants such as citrus fruits and berries, lemons, limes, oranges, grapefruits, strawberries, blackberries, blueberries, etc., will help reduce inflammation and heal the lungs. Lastly, leafy greens and herbs such as Brussels sprouts, celery, asparagus, bamboo shoots, broccoli, um, spinach, cabbage also contain high amounts of antioxidants and B vitamins, which can um, help repair tissue. The most important thing is to reduce exposure to smoke, irritants as much as possible.